everyone. Uh, my name is MK and I'm a social worker here. We're currently in Barry Center right now. We offer free counseling services and we actually have a new director starting on Monday. So watch for an email containing her contact information in case you do want to set up a free appointment. Um, and thank you guys for coming tonight. I know like Seth said, it's mandatory for most of you, but I do hope that you find it helpful and Preston's definitely going to keep it interesting. So just please respect him and pay attention to the important topics he'll be discussing. Thanks. Isn't MK a great speaker? Give, give MK a hand over here. Yeah. You're telling me, telling me she's nervous up in here. Come on now. It's good to be here. Um, I drove up from Columbus. There's nothing I love more than talking about mental and emotional health care, uh, prevention as opposed to uh, crisis management. Looking in the mirror. I, I talk a lot. To, I work in, in mental health and addiction. That's my job. Uh, I go around speaking all over the state about prevention, trying to get people to utilize services like the counseling office before they feel backed into a corner. But before we get into that, I need a bit of participation tonight. And I know that they made you come to this uh, odd, weird, uh, what is it called, a workshop, a seminar about a topic you may or may not care about, but I am willing to pay you to participate. <laughs> what? <laughs> How does that sound? I'm willing to pay you to participate now, now, now I've never done this before, but we are going to have a rock, paper, scissors tournament, a rock, paper, scissors tournament, and the winner gets a crisp $50 bill. Come on now. Because this can't take a lot of time. All right? This can't. Now, real quick, just so I get a feel, how many people in here are athletes? Athletes, raise your hand. All right. Now, how about non athletes? Not what? All right, we got a couple. Now, non athletes, this is your chance to stick it to these highly athletic. Football. We don't have football. Baseball, volleyball, all the other things, right? All right, here's the rules. Rock, paper, scissors, tournament. Here's what you're going to do. First, you're going to play best out of three. You're going to play someone close to you, right? We're going to do rock, paper, scissors, shoot. You got it? Rock, paper, scissors, shoot. Two rules. One, no cheating, right? This is the honor system. If you lose, you must cheer on the person that just stuck it to you. Y'all ready? Now, here's what you're gonna do. You're gonna play the people around you, right? This needs to be quick. You're gonna play the people around you. When you run out of people, you're gonna move to the aisles, right? Then you're gonna play people in the aisles. As we start to uh, narrow down people, the, 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 we're gonna work our way down to the front and the last two are gonna get the privilege of coming up here and having a best out of five rice rock paper scissors tournament for fifty dollars. How does that sound? All right. Does everyone know how to play rock paper scissors? Right. All right. Let's get going. Play your partner. Let's go. Best out of three. Let's go.
like my boy Raphael. What, what does that mean, winners in life? Do y'all know the, the, the stati statistical possibility of becoming a human? What is the statistical possibility of becoming a human? Anybody know? 400 trillion to one. Does that sound crazy? Four, it's, it's almost impossible that your parents got together at the perfect time to have you. So when we talk about perspective, many of y'all are going to go through hardships in life. Many of y'all have been through hardships. As you come up, as you're coming up, uh, what family you grew up in, what neighborhood you grew up in, 
Do you have the ability to gain perspective to move forward? Hopefully what I'm going to do today is I'm going to open the door to some new ideas to hopefully have you ask yourself some questions about the roots. Where does this stuff come from? Also, if you want to get real deep, we can look into, or if we have more time, we can look into uh, how, do you, how do you feel when you compete? Do you have a chip on your shoulder? Where does the chip come from? Do you quit when things get hard? Do you step back when it's time to lead? Right? These are deeper rooted issues that you get into when you start to practice coaching, counseling, and support group, which is what I'm going to talk to you about today. What do you think of when you think of the word stigma? Someone tell me what stigma means. Stigma. Stereotype? Y'all heard that before? Stereotype of a mental illness? What else? What do you think of when you think of stigma? Stigma, come on. What is it? Assumptions. Stereotype assumptions. Are y'all good with that? Prejudice? Bias? Right? What do you think of when you think of mental health? What comes to mind? Mental health, what do you think of? Depression, what else? Anxiety, suicide, what else? Insomnia. PTSD, bipolar, right? What about, what about addiction? What comes to mind when you think of addiction? Now, hey, now everybody got opinions all of a sudden. Everybody got opinions. What do we think of when we think of addiction? Drugs, what else? Alcohol? Nicotine? Isn't it interesting, when we talk about stigma, we talk about addiction, we talk about mental health, what most people think of is illness. They think of being sick, right? So, so people are meeting all over the country for Suicide Awareness Month, Recovery Awareness Month. We're trying to bring awareness to mental health and addiction. And I go around all over the state and I talk to groups and I say, well, let's try it. How many people think it's important to do more for those that struggle with mental health and addiction? Raise your hand if you think it is important to do more for those that are struggling with mental health and addiction. Raise your hand. There's a lot of people not raising their hand. They don't really care about them peaks, do they? I travel all over the country and I ask people, how many people think it's important to do more for mental health and addiction? The whole room raises their hand. But what's also happening is internally that person goes, oh yeah, that's important for them. You know, the crazy people. You know, the ones that are getting arrested, using needles. Right. That's them. Although we go to campuses and we try to get people to participate in basic services like coaching, counseling and support group. And yet most people don't identify with it. If you do identify, you're embarrassed and ashamed because of what? Stigma, judgment, prejudice. So what ends up happening is most people wait until they are in utter desperation before they reach out for help. I'm on a mission, fam. I'm on a mission to make coaching, counseling, and support groups as common as going to the gym or hiring a personal trainer. Coaching, counseling, and support groups. The most basic level of service. 90% of people will never need more than basic coaching, counseling, and therapy. And if we can get people looking at those services as if they were going to hire a personal trainer or as if they were going to hire a life coach to help them with their mental fitness, as if they were going to hire them as a coach to help them reach their goals, we must shift the perspective 
around the basics if we want to make any headway around mental health and addiction stigma. Uh, I'm from a small town in Texas. Why am I up here? I'm from a small town in Texas. I grew up uh, in a place called College Station, where Texas A&M is. Uh, my family did a lot of things right. My father was a, a newspaper publisher. My mom was a hairstylist. They thought, taught me great morals and values like uh, don't lie, cheat, and steal. Uh, if it ain't yours, don't take it. Uh, when you shake someone's hand, where do you look at them? In the eye. They taught me the value of hard work. Both of them were business owners. We don't call in sick, right? We show up. Unbeknownst to them, they also taught me things like, um, if you work hard, you get to what? You hear that? If you work hard, if you pay your bills, if you take care of business, you can do what? Whatever the heck you want, right? Because that's what responsible, productive people do. What I also learned was everything was funner and more interesting when there were ice chests around, you know, uh, full of those things that come in the 12, 18, 24 packs. When there was a keg around, when there was those bottles of, of liquid with the big handles, everybody was in a better mood. And even if they weren't in a bad mood, at least things were exciting. Right? They didn't tell me that. I picked up on it as a child. What I also picked up on was uh, when mom or dad came home and they were stressed out, right? They could have a, a substance in the form of a, a, maybe in a can or they mix a drink and all of a sudden their mood would change. So I learned from a young age that I could use substance, things outside of myself to change the way I feel. If I want to have a good time, use substance and I can have what? A better time. If I'm stressed out, if I'm worried. If I'm angry, if I'm sad, I can have a little something, something, and it'll numb me out so I can deal. I'm talking about the, the lessons that I picked up just by observing the people around me. So as soon as I got old enough, I started experimenting, first with alcohol, then marijuana, then other substances. Uh, and and one, on one hand, I was a very good kid. I showed up to school every day. I made A's and B's. I played sports. But I got my first DWI my senior year in high school. I was 17 years old. At this point in my, in my life, I knew nothing about the disease of addiction. I knew nothing about the chronic and progressive nature of substance misuse and abuse. Someone tell me what chronic and progressive means. Chronic and progressive. Keeps getting worse. Or sometimes whenever some people deny things that happen to you. They deny things that happen. Chronic progressive. If you have chronic diabetes, does it go away? If you have chronic heart disease, does it get better? It typically gets worse over time, progresses over time, especially when you start using substances to manage the way I feel. That also includes prescription medication. Usually your tolerance goes up. Therefore, you have to use what? More medication. Change the medication. More substances, right? You start to layer things on. I didn't know about that at 17 years old. All I knew was... Why are they after me? It's not my fault. Why am I in trouble? I show up to school every day. I turn in my work. Now I cheated a lot, but I still turn in my work. I graduated high school. I got my real estate license. Two years later, I got a drug possession. A year after that, a DWI. Four months after that, another drug possession. I'm 20 years old, sitting in the back of a police car, wondering how did I end up here again? How is it, fam, that I can be so responsible and productive in some areas of my, of my life? I was a professional. I showed up to work five, six days a week. I was the most successful friend of my friend group that didn't go to college. I knew how to say yes, ma'am, and no, ma'am. I knew uh, uh, how I was supposed to act. As a matter of fact, I was, uh, in my mind, I wasn't doing anything different than the people around me. Everybody around me worked, play hard, right? 
I'm 20 years old, forced into strict probation. The state of Texas insisted that I change my behavior. I was forced into uh, drug and alcohol rehab. I was around a bunch of people that were not like me, right? They didn't look like me. They didn't talk like me. They used different substances than me. Their skin color was different than mine. Their religious uh, affiliations were different than mine. Their sexual orientation was different than mine. They were talking about losing jobs and families and houses. And they were old, fam. They were like in their 30s and 40s. Now that's usually funny when I'm talking to people that are in their 30s and 40s. But to y'all, that's your parents' age. I'm not like them. I ain't like them. But through, through a, a, a few turn of events, some would say a miracle, sponsorship, mentorship, a lot of hard work. This uh, 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 17 days ago, I celebrated 22 years in recovery from drugs and alcohol. Now, fam, when I talk to y'all about this stuff, I'm talking to you because I have thousands and thousands and thousands of hours participating in all the things that is recommended to help you in your life's journey. Sure, I know a lot about the hospital system and the school system and counseling and therapy and all that kind of stuff, but, but more importantly, I have experience in that area. You heard me say earlier, Suicide Awareness Month, Recovery Month. It is important to know that mental health is on the rise. Suicide completion is on the rise. People struggling with drugs and alcohol, opiates. People are dying not because they're overdosing, because they are being poisoned by fentanyl. Someone tell me the difference between overdosing and being poisoned. Someone tell me the difference. Boy, my boy said, one's an accident. You overdose me, I'm using the substance that I knowingly use and I use too much and I overdose. Poisoning means I smoke something, I take something, right? I think it's one thing, but it's laced with fentanyl or some sort of tranquilizer and it kills me, right? It is important to know these things. It is important to know that if your friend starts acting funny and they don't want to come out anymore and they're using particular language like, I don't want to wake up today, I, don't, uh, I should just not be here, or they start giving their stuff away, that there is a, there's, it is important to know that that is a problem. They say, if you see something, say something. But my argument, fam, is that by the time someone gets to a place where they think that the best option is to not wake up, they've been struggling for years. If we get to a point where they are struggling with their drug and alcohol abuse, when they're struggling with anxiety and depression, right, we've missed it. We've missed something. So what do we do? Do we, do we wait till they get sick? Or do we start early? What I talk about is getting into the prevention business and still until uh, getting the prevention business instead of waiting until they get sick business. What does that look like? One of the things that's most important in prevention is quit focusing on symptoms and getting to the roots. We talk about roots. Well, what? Let's talk about the difference between symptoms and roots. Symptom, my behavior. Misusing substances, not knowing if we were going to have a good time or I was going to get pulled over. In some circles that I run in, we talk about I didn't get in trouble every time I used, but every time I got in trouble, I was under the influence of something. Right? Symptom, anxiety, depression, self-worth issues, symptoms, roots. Where does it come from? It is a manifestation of something deeper and if we're just managing symptoms, all we end up doing is throwing medication at it, throwing outside substances at it, trying to manage. It's almost like, uh, it's almost like having a full-blown flu and just addressing a runny nose. We gotta get to the roots. 
and quit talking about the symptoms. Well, how do we do that? My boy, John Bradshaw, he's a uh, family systems therapist from the 80s. We talk about mental health and addiction as if it's some new crisis. John wrote six New York Times bestsellers. He was a, uh, he was a priest for 10 years. He was a, a, an alcoholic in recovery. He did 10 hour specials on PBS. Any of y'all know what PBS is? Right? The public broadcasting system for free. He was doing this stuff in the 80s and what John said is, he says, our issue is not mental health and addiction. He says the issue is emotional dysfunction. What does he mean by that? Emotional dysfunction. What is that? Right. So, so when someone is talking to you, how do you hear it? Is that right? Is that what you're saying? How do you hear what someone is saying to you? What else? I, I've got some. I, I'm, I'm amongst college kids, aren't I? What do you think of when you think of emotional dysfunction? Shutting down. Shutting down. Emotional dysfunction. What do you think of? Say it loud. No control. Right? That makes sense, don't it? Emotional dysfunction. My emotional reaction does not match the situation. Anybody in here ever overreacted to something? Anybody in here, something little happened and you actually misread it like my girl's talking about here? You thought it was something else and you, and you acted in a way and everybody's like, oh my, why, why are you acting like that? It was something, right? Emotional dysfunction. John Bradshaw says 97% uh, of our families are in one way, shape, or form emotionally dysfunctional. Does that sound like a lot? 97% of our families are in one way, shape, or another emotionally dysfunctional. Right? When we talk about alcoholism, how many people do you think suffer from some sort of drug or alcohol addiction? How many people in a percentage? How many people? Say it loud. 75%. Who else? 95. My boy. My boy. 95%. Is that high or low? No, no, no. I like the participation, though. How many? 55. Right? The amount of people that suffer from drug and alcohol addiction or other compulsive behaviors is about 1 in 10. That's 10%. Right? Why do so many people think that it's higher? Because we typically hang around people that act like us, look like us, drink like us, use like us, vote like us. So if we come from a dysfunctional or chaotic background, we often think everybody does it this way. Right? So when we talk, let's talk about mental health. How many people do you think struggle with some sort of diagnosable mental health? Everybody? Give me some percentages. 15%? 99%? 75? According to NAMI, National Alliance of Mental Illness, it's a 1 in 5. That's about 20%. Say, say it loud. I heard genetic and family. You're, you're a genius. You must know where we're going here. Right? So, so we're, we're over here talking about, do we talk about, if we're going to advocate for those struggling with mental health and addiction, should we advocate for people that are like, let's say, 10 to 20%? Most of those people don't even identify with being an addict, alcoholic, having substance use disorder, or mental illness. Or should we talk about the 97% of people that come from uh, uh, emotionally dysfunctional families? Now that number has been adjusted a bit. They actually say that the number is closer to 60 to 70%. But what I would argue is emotional dysfunction, remember what my emotional reaction is to compare to the situation. Emotional dysfunction is on a scale. If I'm emotionally dysfunctional like a two, three, and he's an eight, who are you? who do you think we're paying attention to? Right. So I go, wow, he, that, that family's messed up over there. We're good. We don't even realize that how we are parenting, how we are relationshiping, how, how I'm a friend to you is dysfunctional. 
But by talking about that, not only can we be more inclusive, right? We can look at the similarities and not the differences. But by talking about emotional dysfunction, we can naturally help those that are struggling with mental health and addiction. And we can hopefully get to them before they end up in my hospital in the back of a police car kicked out of college. Emotional dysfunction. Let's talk about what that might look like. My boy John Bradshaw says... Our society is emotionally sick because our families are emotionally sick and our families are sick because we are living by inherited rules we didn't write. Inherited rules we didn't write. What do you think of when you think of inherited rules that came from your family that were passed down to you that you may or may not agree with. Inherited rules you didn't write. What do you think of? I'll give you a hint. This is very easy. Men don't. Y'all hear that before? Y'all hear that before? Do you hear that? Men don't cry. Boys don't play with those toys. Girls don't act like that. Say it loud. Boys will be boys. What are some other inherited rules that were passed down to you that were probably from uh, past generations? Say it again. You can't eat before, he's giving tips over here. You can't eat before you drink. How about, um, how, I got one. How about what happens in this house? Come on now. What happens in this house stays in this house. Why does what happened in this house, why does it need to stay here? It's no one else's damn business, they said. Right? That if someone else knew what happens in this house, one, they may look down their nose at us, or two, someone might get in trouble. I might be embarrassed and ashamed if they find out. Right? How about this one? Um, uh, you better quit crying before I. Come on, dog. Y'all know, are we related? I think we're related. Quit crying before I give you something to cry about. Right? Let's, let's imagine for a second. Imagine for a second. Quit crying. You have a child who is having an emotional reaction, right? Big emotions. Their brain is not fully developed. When is your brain fully developed? 25. 25. Right? Imagine a five, six, seven, eight year old having big emotions and their caregiver, their mom, their dad, their granny, somebody says, quit feeling before I hurt you and why do I hurt you somebody I already know somebody knows it quit feeling before I hurt you and I hurt you because I love come on dog because I love you and we wonder why our relationships might be a little bit dysfunctional another inherited rule uh, uh, don't trust don't feel right if I can't if I can't trust my caregiver with my emotions, right? If I get in trouble for something that I don't even know why I'm getting in trouble, can you imagine a child says, feelings are not safe, therefore I'm going to stuff them down, right? And then someone says, how do you feel? And you go, I don't know. I'm not sure. Say it one more time. That's right. This is something that's happening at the school level. I would say that, that we need to start introducing kids to counselors and coaches in elementary school. Not because something's wrong, because they're learning to check in with their thoughts, feelings, attitudes, and emotions. They're learning how to navigate. Parents say, we need help from our students. I mean, sorry, we need help from the school. But the parents also don't want the school to always know everything about the family. Why? They might get in trouble, right? So we're advocating for mental health and addiction resources, but yet the people that need it can't 
talk. Not everybody. But there's a weird uh, relationship between school and families. Right? Don't trust, don't feel. Can we agree for a second? Can we agree for a second that if a child is raised in an alcoholic or drug addicted home, that that is not a good environment? Can we agree on that? If a child is raised in an alcoholic or drug addicted home, can we agree that that is not a great environment for learning? So let's set alcoholism and drug addiction aside for a second and let's just talk about some family dysfunction. Here's some family Different family dysfunction types. One, perfectionistic families. These are uh, families with super high expectations. Praise is tied to performance and emphasis on perception. Right? Don't let them know who you really are. Extremely, uh, extremely high expectations. Right? Achieve, achieve, achieve. Praise is tied to performance. If you are not performing, I'm going to withhold what? If you are not making the grade, performing and doing well, I'm going to withhold what? Freedom, my love. Therefore, as a child, I learn that I have to perform in order to be loved. The next one, overly strict homes, uh, militaristic homes. These are homes with rigid rules, often physically or verbally abusive, harsh punishments, extremely secretive, often associated with strict military and strict religious homes. Now, I didn't say military homes, and I didn't say religious homes. I said overly strict military and religious homes. Punishment doesn't match the crime. Dad rules a house with an iron fist. Some people would say, oh, well, we don't hit our kids. But they shame and guilt them to death with the fear of this religious book. Often physically or verbally abusive. What do you think is worth? Physical abuse or verbal abuse? Verbal all day, every day. If I can rob you of your will, right, you will behave, and then we expect you to go off to college and get into a nice relationship. Overly strict homes. The next one. Uh, someone tell me what a hypochondriac is. <laughs> What's a hypochondriac? She knows. Forgot about everything. They think they're sick all the time. Right? There's always something. It's scary. John Bradshaw says a hypochondriac is often addicted to sadness. Right? One way to get attention is if you're sick, right? And we've heard our thoughts can manifest into physical symptoms, often stomach aches, headaches, autoimmune issues. The next family type, hypochondriac family, uh, someone that is mentally or emotionally sick in the household, or someone that is physically or chronically sick, right? Have someone with a disability in the home, right? These are, these are homes that um, generate strong feelings of uh, uh, high levels of fear, pessimism, anxiety, depression, distorted views of reality. They go to extreme measures to protect people, and they're often very manipulative. Family, I am not talking about alcohol and drug addiction. Right? I'm talking about family, emotional dysfunction. Physical, verbal, or sexual abuse. That's pretty obvious. The next one, foster care and adoption. Right? How many people believe that if someone is raised in foster care or adoption, that they may have a, 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 a certain perception of being abandoned? That makes sense, doesn't it? But what about products of divorce? Right? Foster care, adoption, and divorce. No matter how well the parents uh, make the effort to make sure that you know it is not your fault. Kids, it is not your fault. Mommy and daddy are not good together. The kids may even believe that mommy and daddy are not good together. But what does the child believe is really the reason? Come on now. When the, when the parents get divorced, no matter what they tell the kid, what does the child believe is a problem? Maybe I could have done something. Is it shocking that those that are raised in foster care adoption or product of divorce uh, struggle with feelings of guilt, worthlessness, low self-esteem, abandonment, difficulty trusting others? Shocker. 
Family, I ain't talking about drug addiction, alcoholism, or mental health. I'm talking about how do I handle my feelings when I have these belief systems based on my past that are real. And then I'm expected to come act and perform at school like a normal person. And I'm not utilizing a coach, a counselor, or a support group. So I'm stuck uh, uh, carrying everything on my own back. Right? We talk about stigma. Only weak people go see a counselor. Only sick people, ill people, people that can't handle it, go see a therapist. Right? Other compulsive or other behaviors that come from these type of families. People that are uh, addictively, addicted or compulsively blame. I blame everybody else for my feelings. Right? If it is your fault that I feel this way, where is all the power? What am I doing with my power if it's your fault that I feel this way? Who's got the power? Who's got it? Right? If I can't take responsibility and I blame you, I never have to do nothing. I would much rather blame you for my feelings. Perfectionism. This is an interesting one. Often people that struggle with perfectionism, often there's a high level of uh, anxiety. They're often really high performers. They're really good at things. They often worry a lot, but the one that goes uh, under uh, undiagnosed is the underachiever. Underachievers that struggle with perfectionism. What does that mean? Underachiever. They know they can't be perfect, so what do they do? They mail it in. They give up. If I don't try, I don't even have to worry about being perfect. They go underdiagnosed, under the radar. They would, never, they would never believe that an underachiever, a quitter, a one that gets right up to the finish line and pulls everything down on their head, they would never call them a perfectionist. But family, if we don't educate ourselves about what this looks like, roots versus symptoms, we can never address the problem. Hypervigilance, on high alert all the time, right? Always worried, waiting for the other shoe to drop, right? There are some positive to some of these things. Someone that's hypervigilant, they can read people very well. Someone that's a perfectionist, you might want them on your team because they do all the work, right? Righteousness. Getting high on righteousness. What's that mean? Getting high on righteousness. We are right. They are what? Going to hell. No, I'm kidding. Right? They're the, that political organization is the reason we're like this. Right? You're, you're in and you're out. Getting high on righteousness. Bam. If we just look at drug and alcohol addiction and mental health, we miss, we are missing the vast majority of how people relationship. Other compulsive behaviors. What are some other compulsive behaviors that don't involve drug and alcohol addiction? Other compulsive behaviors. What can people do compulsively? Say it again. Not repair, something. <laughs> Not repair something in their house. They just leave everything undone. What else? Eat. Eat. Compulsive lying. Gaming. Working out. Overeating. Undereating. Gambling. Spending. Saving. Cleaning. Y'all ever been to someone's house and every five minutes they're vacuuming so they can see the lines in the carpet? Y'all ever seen that? Compulsive behavior, emotional dysfunction shows up in all, all sorts of ways. Fam, if we just look at drug and alcohol use, we are missing how most people struggle. Now, that sounds like a lot of dysfunction, doesn't it? A lot of trauma, a lot of uh, uh, dysfunctional relationships. But you think maybe those that are successful you know, financially, career-wise, business-wise, athletically. Maybe they, they got it figured out, don't you think? Those successful people, they don't struggle with self-worth, self-doubt, negative thinking, do they? Here are the top ten emotional struggles that successful people have in common. Imposter syndrome, what is that? Say it again. Not being yourself. Not feeling as if they deserve the accolades. 
They win the game. They're MVP. They make the money. They, uh, they successfully sell a business. They don't feel as if they deserve to be there. Loneliness, feeling isolated and disconnected for others, even when they're surrounded by people. Self-doubt, questioning your abilities and self-worth, even if you have achieved great things. Anxiety, feeling of worry, fear, uh, fear of the future, even when there's no real danger. Depression, feelings of sadness and hopelessness. Stress, feeling overwhelmed and uh, uh, burdened by the demands of life. Burned out, workaholism. Relationship problems, difficulty maintaining healthy and fulfilling relationships. Right? The successful people, they got all the money, all the accolades, still struggling with the same thing. Workaholism, that's a big one. What's the difference between a father that abandons the family, a father that gets locked up, and a father that works 60, 70, 80 hours a week? What's the difference? There is no difference. You ask the kids, they still struggle with feeling abandoned. Does that mean that our parents are bad? No. Right? I started this out that my parents did a lot of things right. Right? For the most of most of us, our parents did the best they can with what they had, just like you did, are doing, and will do. But if we are not armed with this information, we are destined to repeat the same problem. So let's talk about some solutions. What do you think? What do you think is more valuable? Getting rid of getting rid of negative thinking or focusing on positive thinking? What's, what, what are you going to get more mileage out of? Eliminating ne negative thinking or getting good at positive thinking? Positive, yeah. Overwhelmingly, the research says that negative thinking, getting rid of negative thinking is way better than having positive thinking. Why is that? One of my favorite authors, his name is Trevor Moab. He talked about the power of neutral thinking. It's not bad, it's not good. In athletics, it's not focusing on the scoreboard, not focusing on what happened on the last play. It's focusing on form, what is my role, what's next. Right? He was a coach to Russell Wilson, a two-time Super Bowl quarterback. Right? Trevor Moab said that a negative thought, one negative thought, is, is seven to ten times strong, stronger than a positive one. Is that crazy? One negative thought, seven to ten times stronger. That means uh, if I'm a, a powerful, positive thinker, I need seven to ten positive thoughts just to equal one negative one. And if I say that negative one out loud, multiply it by 10. So if I say something negative out loud, it's the coach's fault. It's the uh, uh, RH fault. It's their fault. If I say it out loud, even if I'm thinking positive, saying it out loud is 70 to 100 times stronger than that positive thinking. Does that surprise you? Right? If we can get rid of negative thinking, we can change not only how we feel about ourselves, but where we're going and how we reach our goals. Price uh, Pritchard, he wrote a book called U, Squ U Squared. It's a great book. It's very thin. Those are the kind of books I like to read, maybe like 30 pages. He said that that negative thought, it's like how do you identify the negative thought? The negative thought is the villain that you have in your head, the critic, the demotivator, the discounter, the one that raises all the doubts, the one that says you ain't good enough. They're not going to like you. You can't do it. No matter what you do, you're not going to be able to make it. Right? How does that show up? It shows up in black and white thinking. Either I'm going to pass this test or I'm a terrible person. Right? Either someone's all good or they're all bad. What a negative self-talk. Disqualifying the positive. I come to a presentation. I do a great job. One person complains. Who do I focus on? One person. You get one negative comment on your uh, social media thread. That's all you think about. Right? I'm talking about the power of negative uh, uh, thinking. Why is it that when you turn on the news or you look on social, what do you see the most of? Politics. <laughs> Politics. If it bleeds, it leads. It's never positive. Comparing yourself to others. Should statements. Anybody struggle with shooting on themselves? 
right? I should be better. I should be smarter. I should have showed up. I shouldn't have said that, right? I shouldn't have went around the block. I did that today. I saw a perfect parking spot. I thought I could get something better. I didn't find it. What did I say? Man, you should have got that, right? But luckily, I'm working on correcting my negative thinking, so I stop myself. I'll tell you about that. Regret. Shoulda, coulda, woulda. Self-criticism. And here's a big one. Victim mentality. <laughs> Victim mentality. The sneaky thing about all this is most people that struggle in these areas, negative self-talk, victim mentality, blaming, don't think they do it. Because it's so sneaky. It is so normal that when I say I want to do something, sub subconsciously, subtly it goes, but don't get your hopes up because it's probably not going to work out. I've been doing that for 40 years. How long do you think it's going to take me to change that behavior? Victim mentality. Many people have struggled uh, from uh, their families and backgrounds. Some crazy stuff has happened to people in this room. There are bad things that, are, that have happened and that are going to happen. But until I take full responsibility for who I am, where I come from, and what happened to me, until I take total responsibility, all the power is with them. Right? I'm not saying ignore what happened. But if I can get out of a victim mentality, eliminate negative, move to neutral to more positive and take full responsibility for where I go, I'm going to consistently get the same thing. It's kind of like in relationships, right? You know anybody that's uh, gone from dysfunctional crazy relationship to dysfunctional crazy relationship to dysfunctional crazy relationship? And we go, I don't know what's wrong. I don't know how that happened. Or someone that keeps ending up in trouble or the back of police cars over and over. I don't know what's wrong. Right? What are some things that we can do? People underestimate the amount of time it takes to change a behavior. What do I mean by that? People underestimate the amount of time it takes to change a behavior. Everybody in here, most everybody in here is an athlete, right? One of y'all four athletes? What do you what do you do? Volleyball. volleyball. What's your name? Kylie. Kylie. I want to be as good as you at volleyball, Kylie, and I'm serious now. I'm gonna practice two hours a month. How, how do you think I'm gonna do? Good. That all right, four. Four hours a month. What do you think? <laughs> Kylie said I got no chance. Right? Even people that are willing to see a counselor, how often do you think the average person sees their counselor? One to two hours a month. Do you think that you can make long-term change working on your mental and emotional health care one to two hours a month? There is nothing you are good at that you didn't spend hundreds and thousands of hours getting good at. What do we do? Well, I would argue if we treated our mental and emotional fitness like we do volleyball, like we do basketball, like we do soccer, playing uh, rock, paper, scissors for hours. Rugby, here we go. Right? If we start treating our mental and emotional fitness like we do physical fitness, right? We might have a chance of changing our behavior long term. So what does that look like? If you, even if you're willing to go hire a coach or a counselor, did you know you have access to free coaching and counseling here at Raya? Did you know that? MK, the, the awesome speaker that came up and talked here, she's a counselor. If you're uncomfortable seeing a counselor, call your life coach. They're about to hire another one. That means they can take on more people. Right? Trevor Moab always says you don't have to be, uh, you don't have to be sick to get well. Let's start now. Right? If we start now, now we're in the prevention business, not wait till uh, crap hits the fan business. So if we need to treat our mental and emotional fitness like regular fitness, we need to work out how many hours a week, you think? How many hours? How many hours you work out a week? 
putting her on blast now. She's squirming. How many hours do you think the average person, not even someone that is a, a collegiate athlete, someone that just wants to lose a little weight, how many hours? Six to seven. Let's say I work out five days a week for an hour, right? I also got to get ready to go to the gym. I got to uh, go home and clean up after the gym. I'm probably going to go to group fitness classes, right? I'm going to start meeting people that are doing some of the same thing. I'm going to do something about my eating, which means I spend more time shopping and cooking, right? Five, five to six ain't, ain't really enough. It's really more like 10 to 15 is really more average. So if we can only see a counselor once a week max, that's an hour, what do we do with the rest of our time? What do we do? The first thing I would recommend is get yourself a meditation practice. Get yourself a meditation practice. Jen Sincero, uh, she wrote... Uh, you are a badass series. She's got about six books. You're a badass at money. You're a badass at habits. You're a badass at changing self-doubt. Right? Get a meditation practice. She's talking about going to the spiritual gym. I wake up at four in the morning. I do on average 30, 30 minutes to three hours of meditation seven days a week. Is that crazy or what? If I said I do that in the gym to get fit, you wouldn't think I was crazy. Get a meditation practice. Some of you are thinking, oh, man, I can't, sit, I can't sit still for that long. Well, join the club. I can't shut my brain off. And nobody can. There's tons and tons and tons of hours on YouTube to learn how to meditate. I like Joe Dispenza. He's a guy that does guided meditation. You can do quiet meditation by neural beats. Get you a meditation practice. The next thing is every single day read positive literature and listen to positive spe uh, uh, talk, uh, speeches, motivational speakers. How many people know of Eric Thomas, a hip-hop preacher? Anybody know Eric Thomas, a hip-hop preacher? Come on now. Right? Every day read some positive literature, a self-help book, a motivational book, a spiritual religious book. Hopefully it doesn't have a bunch of shame and guilt in it. Right? Instead of listening to negative people talk about the news and clowning everybody, talking smack about everybody, listen to positive literature every single day. I'm an audiobook guy. I like to listen to my stuff. What's the next thing? Build a support team around you. What does that mean? Have friends around you that can hold space. Now, I want to be very clear about this. Not everybody, not everybody is worthy of hearing your stuff. What do I mean by that? Tell me, what do I mean by that? Not everybody is worthy of hearing your deep, dark secrets. How do you identify those people? Come on, dog. Ain't nobody ever told your stuff to your neighbor? Because, right? You tell them something, if the team finds out, they ain't a good person. Right? That person also, right, that person also, uh, uh, they can't just uh, co-sign your bull junk either, right? They can't be like, oh, yeah, you're right. They are crazy, right? They need to be supportive and support you in your personal developed journey. And they need to be doing their personal developed journey, right? I call that be a do-as-I-doer. When I talk to you about all this stuff, I'm a do-as-I-doer, not a do-as-I-sayer. Do as I do, not I think you should go see that. Do you see a counselor? No, I don't. Oh, well, why, why are you telling me what to do, right? Be a do as I do or develop a support team. This is uh, something that I heard on a podcast recently, which was profound. If I do not share, if I do not share my struggles with my friends, I rob them of, an, of their ability to be my friend. If I do not share with you that I'm struggling, I do not give them the opportunity to be a friend and support me. Right? I talk to people all over the country and all they talk about is, I want to help people, I want to help people, I want to help people. But they never want to ask for help. We must be do as I doers, not do as I sayers. For some of y'all that, that uh, struggle in other areas that are a bit more serious, there's support groups, peer-led support groups, AANA, NAMI, uh, Codependence Anonymous, uh, Adult Children of Alcoholics and Dysfunction. Uh, support groups, right? Treat your mental and emotional health care like you would your physical fitness. I'm going to wrap up with this, and I'm going to need your help. You think we can do that? I want you to repeat after me. You ready? I am worthy 
I am worthy of greatness. I am worthy of good things working out with me. I am valuable. I am a do as I doer. My solution is in the mirror. Thanks for letting me share.